Oh, hey there. It's me, it's Scott. And uh, I'm all alone in my apartment right now. Normally, we play some games on Sunday nights every couple weeks. Unfortunately, my crew that I work with, Mike, Ben, uh, were either unavailable or there were just not enough people around to get a game together. So, you know, it's after the holidays, things happen. And uh, I'm at home though, I've got some free time tonight. Not a ton, this is probably gonna be a relatively short stream, but uh, I have a bit of time, so I figured I would set everything up myself and run and play something on my own, run the stream and play something on my own. Um, yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't really have a plan for this, exactly. I, uh, I've got, you can see I have a tripod here, sorta in my way a little bit. I've got my stream box just off the side here, off just off screen, and so, yeah, yeah, I'm Scott. Uh, this is the I don't have any sort of plan for this facing player live stream. And I hope that things don't go terribly, but they might. Who knows? Who can say for sure? And uh, I normally have a bunch of people working with me, like I said, and they help things go smoothly. They help us have a good time. But tonight it's just me. So, hey guys. My cats, are actually, I'm sorry, it's not just me. My cats are on the couch right now. They're being very sweet. And uh, I don't know if that'll persist for a while, uh, for, for too long even, because uh, when it's typically just me in the apartment and my wife is out, she's out for a little while right now, uh, my cats can get a little restless. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But in the meantime, for those of you joining live, thank you for those of you watching after the fact. Uh, thank you as well, though I'm not really sure what you're going to be watching. Um, so yeah, why don't we, uh, I have two cameras set up right now. I don't have, normally we have four. Uh, but tonight I've only got two going because uh, Mike owns some of the equipment that we use. Uh, I own about half, he owns about half, and he is working a shoot right now with some of that equipment. Uh, so I am going to be running a little slim. I've got a, sh uh, a camera down on the table and then a camera that you're looking at right now on me. Before we play anything, right now I have PAX Premier 2nd Edition set up and I'm going to play the solo bot just a little bit. Uh, we'll see if I finish or not but we will play it for a little while. I, uh, I have a few games that I've got recently, either have gotten recently or have had a renewed interest in, and I wanna talk about them a little bit. There's some cool things, some stuff that I wanna bring to the channel and play a little bit on, uh, on both live videos as well as doing some recorded videos, and I wanna just talk about them right now because they're, they're on my brain. Uh, Kurt is asking if Pan's Transhumanity is any good solo. I haven't played it solo, actually. I have only played it, uh, I've played it Four, uh, not four, I played it three players twice and I played it two players once. And I thought it was good at those two counts. I have no idea about solo play though. I could, uh, actually I can't remember. Is there a solo bot in Transhumanity? I am not sure. I could see it being fun playing it multi-handed where you kind of set it up for multiple players but you play each individual player. That's I know a common way to play like war games and, uh, and, and some other things. It's what I do to learn games, usually. You kind of play each part individually and sort of pretend like you don't know what each other player wants to do. It can be a bit of an exercise. Uh, it can certainly be a good way to see how systems function in a game. Uh, as far as doing that in Transhumanity, I think it'd work well. Uh, I don't know if there is a solo bot, though, like there is in Pamir. Uh, so yeah, don't know about Transhumanity solo exactly. but. Why don't we switch down to the table camera and have a look at some of the games that I have uh, sitting in front of me right now. Let me see here. Uh, I'm flying all those equipment solo right now, so pardon me if I'm kind of looking around or reaching around a little while. Uh, let's get a nice cool fade. All right, so uh, as you can see, I have Premiere kind of set up over here. I'm gonna bring it down in just a bit. But otherwise, I've got a stack of, there's actually four games total in this stack. Uh, there are two in this bottom box. But uh, a game I actually just got in the mail yesterday that was sent over to me was uh, this copy of Mushroom Eaters. I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, this title or the company that puts it out, Blast City. Uh, the, the designer is Nate Hayden. And uh, we did a stream of Sea Evil recently. And uh, Sea Evil is designed by a few different people, but Nate Hayden is one of the chief ones and Mushroom Eaters is like a very near and dear game to him, I know. Uh, and I was lucky enough to grab a copy or uh, just recently have one sent over to me uh, by Nate actually. So thank you Nate for sending this by. Uh, this is a weird game, I think. I have not played it yet, 
but as you might guess by the art on the cover, it's a little trippy, it's a little out there, and it's not honestly what would typically be in my wheelhouse. Or I guess let me back up on that a little bit. Uh, mechanically, it is not typically what would be in my wheelhouse. I usually like kind of heavy, thinky strategy games, things like Pax Pamir, or uh, really uh, uh, many Sierra Madre games, or stuff from Splatter like Food Chain Magnate or Indonesia, uh, games like Age of Steam, stuff that's like really tight on rules and very competitive and very cutthroat. But uh, Mushroom Eaters is not really that, I don't think. It's more of an adventure experience game. And the theme certainly speaks to me, uh, it very personally speaks to me. And Nate Hayden's stuff, while I would have thought would be very outside of my wheelhouse, has so far of what I've played, which is Sea Evil and World War III and Cave Evil, those have all been really fun and, and games I certainly want to return to. Actually, I just played a game of Cave Evil for the first time last week, and I am dying to play it again. It's one of like three games that has gotten in my head and I'm, I'm talking a lot right now, I'm going to switch back up. It's uh, Cave Evil's a game that's gotten in my head, um, like few games do. High Frontier is something that burrowed its way into my brain when I played it and just wouldn't go away. I was like dreaming about that game. And Food Chain Magnate would be another one that kind of got in my head and I played it a bunch. And all, all I wanted to do for months was play Food Chain Magnate more. And Food Chain actually is what probably got me into this heavier, thinkier world of games. Cave Evil from Nate Hayden uh, is another one that really got, got my goat in a, in a good way. Uh, it, it's, it'll certainly make its way onto Phasing Player before too long, Cave Evil will. Um, but yeah, so Mushroom Eaters, going back down here, is a game from that same designer. It is very different mechanically, and it, visually it is insane. It is, it is a trip and a half. Uh, now it's a game, as you might guess, about eating mushrooms, right? It's a game that's about uh, going on a sort of uh, spiritual, psychedelic, hallucinogenic journey. And um, the art and the setup of the game really reflects that. So why don't we open it up here uh, and have a look. Pardon my somewhat cramped space here. Like I said, I'm low on equipment tonight, so we're just kind of making do. Uh, oh, the rules also do specify, in case anyone's curious, this game is... Uh, absolutely unplayable on mushrooms. So despite the title and the theme, please do not eat psychedelic mushrooms uh, and try to play this game. The rules say you can't do it, so don't do it. But it comes with a bunch of pieces, a bunch of cards. I'll open these cards up in a sec. We're not going to spend too long looking at these. I'll, I'll get to Pax Premier relatively quickly. But the things I really want to look at when it comes to this game are the board. The board is going to be kind of the big thing. And uh, the 3D glasses it comes with. So it comes with, as you see, a bunch of little pieces as well as uh, a bunch of stacks of cards. And it's got some really wild out there art that at first glance seems non-functional. Like there are, there are pieces of this that are functioning mechanical elements, but others are very much just visual artifacts. And the, sort of the, the, the idea of this game is to put the player on a journey as though they were sort of going on this spiritual path. And I think the visual element, even though it's not a mechanical thing where you're gonna interact with it, it's meant to evoke very specific emotions and feelings. And so in that way, the, the visual art, the visual aspect of the game is sort of a part of the game, if that makes sense. Uh, but like I said, yeah, it comes with a bunch of 3D glasses that you uh, can look at the board with. Purely optional, no gameplay relevance really with this, just another way to immerse yourself in the art and the feeling of this title. But the big thing in this game, and what I've read and been told, uh, the biggest pain in the patookas to put together, because a lot of this was put together by hand, uh, was this board. And this board is is unlike any board I've ever seen in a game. I've never seen a, a, a game board that sort of evolves as you play it in the way this does. So uh, it starts off, let me open it up the right way here. The game starts off with this sort of setup. Uh, you, you begin up here, the sort of the theme is that you are a few people going on this spiritual journey, you drink some mushroom tea, go on a spiritual journey, and this uh, shaman leads you along this path. And you're following her, 
and uh, experiencing different things in the cards and the pieces as the game goes on. Uh, but as the game goes on, you're going to hit these different points which are going to have you do different events. And some of them, like I think this one right down here, which I know you probably can't see super well, but trust me, it's this space, will have you kind of expand your journey. Uh, and when, you, when you do, I don't know how many of you are familiar with psychedelics, but uh, you sort of go through waves, right? You, you start off kind of normal and it gets crazier and crazier before sort of peaking and then petering out. And this, the, the game is meant to represent that. So when you hit these certain spots, you'll actually be flipping over pieces of the board to expand the path you're taking into new areas. And the art fittingly changes with that. And as you hit new spots on these other boards, you will expand this further and further, and the art gets wilder and wilder as you go. Uh, parts of it is, is where like 3D glasses will give you kind of a 3D effect and a weird blurry effect. And the board ultimately opens up into this kind of disparate style where they almost don't fit together like artistically, except uh, the, the path kind of leads you around them. And so it's, uh, it seems like a trip, and I, I don't mean that as like a pun, but it seems like a crazy thing that would be amazing to play and experience. Uh, I will like to um, get it on stream at some point. I don't know how well it is going to, like, like the art is going to visually work in a live streaming format, but I, I certainly want to get it on the channel in some capacity beyond just showing you it right here. Uh, because it really seems like a unique game and a really powerful experience and something that I, uh, I'm very excited to have my hands on uh, and, and show uh, all of you and people that might be interested in it. It is unfortunately out of print at the moment. It's kind of hard to get your hands on. I don't know if there will ever be a reprint of it or not. I know Nate Hayden doesn't often reprint his games, but uh, I, I, think, I think at the very least, knowing that stuff like this is out there and seeing it is kind of a cool thing, almost like a museum piece. And so I, I certainly want to feature it at some point. The cards, as you could probably guess from the board, are kind of crazy looking as well. They're all, you know, unique art, very, um, very, very inspired, very personal, obviously, uh, artwork on all these cards. Again, not super mechanically functional, but uh, I think almost that lack of functionality is part of the game in, in like a weird way. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm excited to check it out. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, uh, Comet Crack, I, I saw your video. I, uh, I, I went looking online for other videos on mushroom eaters. And uh, yeah, it's, um, I think there are certainly ways to portray the game and to kind of show people what it's like and try to get real tight in there and show some details on the art that I, uh, I will certainly be trying to do. Again, I'll, I'll have more cameras available for me when we actually go to do it. But I, um, yeah, there's like a... Like the, the 3D glasses obviously won't play uh, on a cam on live camera, on a video camera in any live or non-live format. But I, um, yeah, it's a, it, it, it's a cool game. Yes, I've, I've, I've seen, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was your video that, that I watched. That was uh, very cool. So uh, in addition to stuff like Mushroom Eaters, I am going to be covering Nate Hayden's other stuff. Uh, we've done World War III, which is available to buy now, as is Sea Evil. Those are both cool games, very different, which I, I do appreciate about Nate's stuff. Uh, and I know he's not the only one that works on like the Emperors of Eternal Evil games, but I think he's the most like notable uh, in terms of kind of public facing uh, ness uh, of of those guys. And um, yeah, we did see Evil from him uh, from Emperors of Eternal Evil, kind of a collective. Uh, World War Three recently from him, which is sort of like a Risk Axis and Allies sort of uh, inspired game. Uh, very disparate games, very different styles. Even Sea Evil and Cave Evil, despite super similar names, are very different. Uh, Cave Evil is almost like a tactical war game. Uh, I actually, I don't know why I said almost is. It is a tactical war game uh, where your necromancers summoning monsters to go fight other necromancers and other monsters uh, on like a hex grid. And uh, he's got like Cave Evil War Cults, which I think is even more like skirmishy. So those will all make appearances on this channel before too long. I, by before too long, I mean in the next like two months probably. I'd say by March, I would expect most of Nate's games to have appeared here. Uh, I've got After Pablo and San Quentin Kings. I'm working on a print and play uh, for some of his other games. And yeah, they'll, they'll, all, they'll all show up uh, before too long. 
So uh, anyway, I kind of wanted to show off Mushroom Eaters because I think it's a super unique looking game and is a style of game I want to feature more on Phasing Player. Uh, more than, I've, I've done a lot of PAX games, right? I've done uh, PAX Renaissance, PAX Transhumanity, PAX Premier I have set up now and might be doing a multiplayer game of it in the next week or two for the channel. And um, I want to explore some other sort of designers as well. And not, not just other designers, but other styles of games beyond just historical uh, or sciencey stuff. I know I've done a lot of Sierra Madre games and I like Sierra Madre a lot, but I do want to branch out a little bit. So let me finish putting away mushroom eaters here. And another game that I have done a little bit uh, of content for on the channel. Uh, Aztec Sun. Aztec Sun is one I am uh, doing a print and play of right now. I have all the files on my computer. They were found on Board Game Geek. And it doesn't seem too hard to put together. Uh, same with After Pablo and San Quentin Kings. Those are, I have print and plays of them that I have begun assembling. Uh, after Pablo is almost done, I'm kind of weighing if I want to buy all the wooden pieces or use the included uh, parts from the print and play for the, the tokens. I kind of want to buy the wooden pieces, uh, but I'm, I, I, they're cheap individually, but shipping can kind of kill the value for wooden pieces. And so I'm evaluating what else I'm going to be printing and playing and trying to do a bulk order of, of bits for that, for After Pablo, San Quentin Kings, and a few other things. Uh, so anyway, uh, like I was saying, another game that I've got that I want to do more stuff on, like a full playthrough, uh, is Dune. And let me switch over here. That was supposed to be a whistle, but my mouth's a little dry. Uh, all right, so Dune. Uh, Dune, this is a print and play that I've done. I actually, I did a video on assembling this exact copy uh, for my channel. I think it's called Making Dune. Uh, you can find it in, in my videos if you want to take a look. It's like 40 minutes, it's kind of long, but if you're interested in how uh, print and play might come together, uh, I'm pretty happy with this copy. There, It's a little janky in a couple of areas, namely the map, but I think for the most part this is a very nice, very playable copy of Dune. Uh, and of course you can also go buy Dune at this point. It's being sold by Gale Force 9 again using the same art Though this, uh, this cover I printed out online and threw some text on. Ah, so, uh, anyway, Dune here, it is a, uh, an old, from I think 1979, game. It's a game from Avalon Hill put it out originally. Uh, and it is published, or not published, uh, designed by the same guys that did Cosmic Encounter. Uh, Peter Aloka, um, Bill Burley and Jack Kitteridge, I think, are, are their names. I apologize if I'm getting those wrong. But uh, this is like a heavier cosmic encounter in some ways and like a weirdo war game in, in some other ways. Uh, I've been very fascinated reading some of the reactions to this game now that it is in print again uh, and for a super affordable price. Like, before Gale Force 9 republished Dune, it was like a hundred to two hundred dollar game on eBay, and honestly, the Avalon Hill pieces kind of suck. They're they're like, for Avalon Hill, they're fine quality for like a 1970s, 1980s game. They're a fine, it's a fine set, uh, but uh, the Gale Force Nine set is way nicer. It's way more playable. The pieces are are in much higher quality. Uh, the art style, it'll. I mean, look, I'm a fan of the old art style. To be honest, I think the Gale Force Nine stuff, which is uh, incidentally this is what uh, Gale Force 9 used, this art set from Ilya. Um, I think that both arts are, are both uh, artistic designs are very good. Uh, I think that if you're looking for a more modern design, the modern version is naturally what you're going to buy because it's cheaper and also maybe what you'll like more. Um, but anyway, I'm rambling now. Uh, I want to play Dune, do a playthrough of this for the channel. Uh, and yes, uh, uh, I am going to be doing a solo play of PAX Premier in just a minute. I just kind of want to touch base on a couple of games. I, before, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get to PAX when I get to it. I'm a little time limited tonight, so uh, we'll, we'll see if I finish it or not. But I, I, will, I will play at least some of it. Uh, so anyway, uh, I do want to do some more big player count games for the channel. Dune is a big one. Uh, it's a, for the most part, it's a six-player game. I have played it a handful of times with five, and I think it works well if you pull the Benny Gesserit out. But uh, my goal is to get six players on, on, on stream. It's not for a lack of bodies to get in the room. It is more of a technical challenge of miking up six people 
getting cameras on six people plus the board plus some close-up areas. Uh, we can do it. We just have to figure out some quirks, um, f uh, fix some quirks. Uh, part of the goal, too, is to be able to do other six-player games like per uh, Here I Stand uh, from GMT and Tom Russell's Westphalia, uh, which is one that I'm hoping to do shortly after Dune. I think Dune will be the next big game I, I do a, a video of. Uh, but after that, I'm hoping that opens up the gates to stuff like, yeah, here I stand in uh, Westphalia and, and other such things. Uh, but yeah, this is the, the print and play I put together in a video. So if you've seen that video, you've seen it. Uh, this is all the same stuff. I got the player shields, the homemade clay spice tokens. And um, yeah, I just, I, I've been itching to play some more of this uh, personally and, and outside of the channel, but also for the channel. Uh, I've added some of the like world dune championship rules uh into this so like away from table discussions which i think is a, always a cool idea um you need to rein in i think table talk a little bit in some games like especially now with cell phones and and other ways to communicate secretly i think you have to really say hey if you guys are going to do secret diplomatic talks it needs to be like timed in some way and so this constitutes uh, these tokens help manage like away from table talk in a game like Dune. Otherwise, everything you say has to be said over the table where everyone can say it. Uh, basically, players get a couple of these at the start of the game and they can expend them for like a five minute secret chat with their allies. Uh, I don't know how I would manage that in a stream if I would get another camera somewhere or mic somewhere to see so people can hear what people uh, are talking about in private or if I would just take this rule out and say you can't go talk in private. Uh, but that's, again, I'm sorry, I'm rambling here. Uh, but yeah, so uh, I, the reason I bring out Dune is because I want to talk about doing bigger games for the channel. Uh, I can fit eight people at my table comfortably. It's just a matter of miking players up properly and getting good video of what's going on. Because, hey, six players at a table or seven or eight can be <laughs> crazy. It can be hard to manage just at the table, let alone getting it on camera and, and with audio. Uh, but Dune is something you can expect in the future for sure. At the very least, it'll be a test for me to test kind of some of the, the uh, audio and video um, capabilities that Phasing Player has. So uh, Dune and Mushroom Eaters along with Nate Hayden's other stuff will be some newer things. Uh, newer, I guess not newer in terms of publishing, just newer in terms of the types of games the channel covers. We're going to be doing some of those uh, in the near future. Hi, Oliver. My cat's coming to visit me here. Uh, but I've done a lot of Sierra Madre games stuff, uh, and I'm going to keep doing Sierra Madre stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do some stuff on High Frontier in the near future. High Frontier is one of my favorite games. Uh, the fourth edition is, in theory, being delivered in like April or May uh, or June, so somewhere in that time. Realistically, I wouldn't expect it before like the winter, uh, based on the last couple of deliveries from uh, Ion Games and Sierra Madre. But it should be a good product when it arrives. In the meantime, I might do some High Frontier Third Edition stuff. Uh, I've I've got that set. I've got custom pieces for it. Uh, I'm it's a game I love very very much. It's one of my favorites, and I uh, I want to get some content for it on the channel. And so. A playthrough of that, I think, is going to be coming probably, I would expect it in the next few months as well, maybe like March-ish. Uh, so somewhere, somewhere like springtime, I would say, some High Frontier stuff. Uh, but the, the, other, the, the game I want to talk about right now is actually two that are also from Sierra Madre. Well, one is. One is from Sierra Madre, and one is from uh, actually Fat Messiah, uh, but developed by Phil Eklund. Fat Messiah and Sierra Madre did a lot of sort of co-promoting and co-publishing of games uh, at a time. And so I kind of lumped the two of them in my head, uh, those guys. But they are, I guess, technically Fat Messiah games and Sierra Madre games are different entities. Uh, but in this blank box from Michaels, I have two games. Uh, one is an older game from Matt Eklund, who did PAX Transhumanity most recently. And that would be his robot combat game, Kriegbot. Uh, Matt was kind enough to send me this copy of Kriegbot. It's been out of print for a bit. And uh, he's talked now and again about doing like a Kickstarter or a revival of Kriegbot. And I hope he does. It's, it's a neat game. Uh, and I think that with some updated art now, which isn't necessarily a slight against this art, I do like this art style. 
Uh, but I think in terms of a mass market appeal, if you switch up the art on this, I think you don't have to do much else. And this is a pretty popular game. Essentially, you have, for those unaware of what it's like, uh, you make these robots. You get these templates. There are six of them in the core game. Uh, this one's Hellabot. There is a uh, hoverbot that's like a hover tank, a uh, car, a robot tank, uh, spider bot, and rocket bot. And they all take similar pieces. So they have primary and secondary weapons, um, drive engines, and uh, so some, other, some other such things, subsystems. It sounds maybe more complicated than it is. Basically, they have main weapons and secondary weapons. And you fill those spots out with, excuse me, you fill those spots out with all of these little cards. And so I, sorry, you can't really see them in the glare. I've also laminated these because uh, they're otherwise cheap construction paper. So you fill these out, like this Tesla gun can go on this rocket bot or a uh, titanium bulwark, and you stick these things onto your robots, and they have their stats, like how far they can shoot and how much damage they might do. And you fight on this hex map. So the game comes with this hex map. It folds out. I'm not, I don't have a lot of room here, so I'm not going to fold it out. But you got this hex map that you send your little miniatures, which, by the way, the miniatures that come in the original Creed bot are super charming. Uh, Spiderbot is represented by this plastic fly that has wings pulled off, so it looks kind of like a spider. And uh, the hoverbot is this like bendy sort of rubber hovercraft. But you send them out onto this map, and then you sort of take turns moving them around and playing like a little a little war game. Uh, you roll some dice that are numbered zero to five, and you uh, you know shoot your weapons at each other and, and try to destroy each other. And it's a pretty, it's a pretty like beer and pretzels game in a lot of ways, but it, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. It, it can be kind of strategic, and it's a team game too, which is fun. It plays uh, like one v one, two v two, or three v three. Generally, it's got a bunch of scenarios in the back of this booklet that you can set up, like you know, lopsided fights or uh, uh, like some kind of cooperative uh, setup. But Kriegbot, I think, is a lot of fun. I've, I've uh, kind of messed around with the idea of doing like Kriegbot tournaments, uh, having players like name their robots and having like round robin style one on one matches and sort of broadcasting that uh, on the channel. I got to figure out some of the details on like logistically how that can all work out, but uh, I think it could be fun. It could be a, a stupid little uh, series of videos that I could do with what is a pretty cool game. Uh, Kriegbot is neat. And uh, it's from Matt Eklund, who, again, he's kind of hitting it big right now with Pax Transhumanity. So kind of going back to see some of the older stuff that Matt has done. Uh, Phil has done a ton of stuff. Matt has worked on a lot of stuff with Phil, but games that are his own, uh, they're, they're sort of few and far between. And Kriegbot, uh, from what he's kind of expressed to me, is it, it feels like it's a very personal like baby of his that he put a lot of work into and has a lot of fun with. And uh, hopefully I could get him in, in, the, in the, the, the stream chat to uh, talk a bit about Kriegbot when I, when I do some videos on it, like he was there for a transhumanity. Uh, it's always nice to get the, the designers in, in the videos, uh, either in person, uh, I, in some situations that I'm kind of working on right now uh, for some future games, or at the very least in the chat to talk about their design, like uh, Matt and uh, Tom Russell and Nate Hayden have been so kind to, uh, to do. Uh, but yeah, a game like Kriegbot, uh, expect that in the future. And there are two other games that are sort of in the... I, I don't want to say the same series as Kriegbot, because it's not really a series, but the same, let's say, like, family tree as Kriegbot. Uh, by which I mean they use similar ship building or systems building mechanics, as well as these same, like, zero to five uh, dice. They're both from, the other two are both from Fat Messiah Games. One is uh, Hard Vacuum, which I don't personally own Hard Vacuum, but someone who's been on the stream a few times, James, uh, does own a copy of Hard Vacuum as well as the expansions. And we, uh, we, we would like to get that on, on the stream at some point as well. Because again, it's kind of a funky, sort of obscure space combat game. And it's fun. It's, it's a fun game. And while, again, I do like heavy stuff. I do like thinky, heavy, complex stuff. But part of phasing player, let me actually switch up. You don't need to stare down at this. Uh, part of phasing player, part of my goal, 
is to target some of these obscure titles, not just heavy stuff, but obscure stuff as well, lesser, lesser known or somewhat unsung games. You know, like uh, like Kriegbot. I think Kriegbot, like I said, I think if the art was a little more modern, maybe the production was a little higher quality. Uh, for a budget title, you know, this is fine. But if you can get little miniatures or or you know. Uh, um, these these robot boards maybe inset with like pieces that slot in i think it could do well i think you could sell this game decently but it's a relative unknown right now uh, and i so i want to kind of focus on somewhat unknown games on phasing player uh and so krieg is certainly one but so is i'm trying to finish putting this away so i can make a nice smooth segue into this other game that i want to talk about which is called Insect. I'm oh, sorry, uh, Insecta. Uh, Insecta is a game from Phil Eklund. Uh, the art also by Phil Eklund. It came out, gosh, I think originally in like 1992. Kriegbot is from, I want to say 2010, 2000, 2008, maybe somewhere around then. This is from quite a bit earlier. This is from 92. This second edition printing is from 95, I believe. Uh, but this was published by Fat Messiah Games, uh, designed by Phil Eklund, who uh, I I'm, assume a lot of people know who Phil Eklund is. If you don't, he is the main dude behind Sierra Madre Games, who did the original Pax Premier. Uh, he did not design the original Pax Premier, of course. Cole Worley did. But Phil put it out, and he's shouted out in the booklet for Pax Premier second edition. And uh, he also did High Frontier. He did, uh, you know, pretty much all the PAX games. He's behind Renaissance and Porfiriana and Emancipation. Uh, his son was behind, you know, Matt is behind Kriegbot and Transhumanity. Uh, Phil has been designing games for a long time. The BIOS games, Megafauna and Origins, all that. Phil has done a lot of stuff. And Insecta is one of his older titles that, like I said, shares some similarities with Kriegbot, or maybe the other way around because Insecta is the older of the set. But you get these insect cards and you, just like in Kriegbot, you build them out with these pieces. So you'll add appendages uh, to your dude, you add abdomens and all sorts of things. You add like heads. Uh, so you make these bugs and once they're complete, once they're all built up, they uh, get these different abilities. So the ability to hop or burrow or fly or perhaps they can shoot out like, um, what is it called? Like the, there are some beetles that fire like, almost like a phosphorus or like a, a, a chemical out of their abdomens that will like goo up other things or burn them uh, in some way. And so you can add those sorts of things to your bugs and then you take them into a map uh, that the game calls the hive. Again, like all good games, it is a uh, hex based. And it's also in black and white, like all good games. So, uh, a joke, by the way. So you, uh, you bring your little bugs, which get represented uh, very charmingly with little uh, rubber bugs that the game came with. Now, I have some of the original rubber bugs elsewhere. These are aftermarket rubber bugs. The originals from the 90s were very much decomposing. And I have, I think, two of the originals in here uh, that were in okay shape. But you, uh, you get these bugs to represent your bugs and they end up on the map, and you uh, you know move them around from hex to hex, and uh, roll roll dice and fight other bugs. It, there's a really interesting like dungeon master mode to this game where you have a group of players making bugs and, and moving them around the map to fight with, and uh, one player that gets this deck of cards, and these decks of cards are all real bugs. Like here's a land crab, and then they have some historical information about land crabs here, or desert millipedes, or stone centipedes. And they all have stats and weapons or, or appendages that they can use. Uh, and you get these like chits that you uh, use to represent the, the dungeon master bugs. And you, they crawl around the map and they go all over the place. And the objective is basically for the players to escape. That you go from like one area to the next before you get out of the hive. And the dungeon master, or the hive master I think it's called, uses these bugs that spawn out of the map to go sort of fight the players. So it's like a, it's got like a Dungeons and Dragons almost style feel to it, like a dungeon crawl feel to it. 
uh, maybe not a world away from like cave evil, right? And to kind of you know bring it around to what we were talking about before. And so uh, I, I think it might be fun to do some videos that are using that hive sort of dungeon master gameplay to, uh, to build out some narrative and maybe some ongoing, some ongoing uh, videos that kind of elaborate on that series. Because those, those Hive Master games can take a while, from what I understand. They can be, uh, be multi-session games. But it's very cool. Like all Sierra Madre stuff, it's got a whole booklet full of uh, scientific information about bugs and about spiders and beetles and all the kinds of stuff they do. And so, uh, yeah, Insecta and Kriegbot. I keep them in the same box because they share a couple of pieces. But they, um, they're, they are kind of maybe more obscure games that I want to start featuring on Phasing Player. In the, in, the, in the future at some point. Um, because yeah, again, I don't think there's, there's not a ton of info out there about them, but they are from notable designers, notable publishers, and are these like, kind of unique ideas that you don't really see elsewhere so much. And I, uh, yeah, I, I've also, I've heard Phil Eklund might want to bring Insecta back in some form. Uh, I don't know if it's gonna be within an existing series, like the Bio series, which is sort of his science-y evolution series, or if it's gonna be its own thing. But yeah, this would be this this, this would be a, a thing you can expect to see at some point. All seven people in the world that have Insecta can uh, can rejoice and maybe get their games back out and play some. So those are all the games that I had kind of set aside that I wanted to talk about right now. Either stuff that I've purchased recently or been uh, donated recently, or things that I I've had a bit that I just want to start featuring on the channel in some capacity. Uh, I don't know what sounds interesting to people and what doesn't. I, um, you know, I'm not trying to poll people for ideas or anything, but I, uh, I am curious to know. Do you, do you guys think any of these games seem interesting in any way? Or are you looking at these and saying this looks stupid? Why, you know, uh, unsubscribe? Uh, but uh, you know, if if that's the case, that's fine, I suppose. But I, uh, I like, I like to try to feature some obscure stuff, right? So let's set. Insecta and Kriegbot aside. Uh, so I know a couple of you have asked, you know, we're saying you saw Pax Pamir appear and I mentioned it at the jump. But yes, I do have Pax Pamir set up over here for a solo game. Now, uh, I have played Pax Pamir before. I've played it on a handful of occasions. Uh, I like it a lot. I'm not sure if I like the second edition or the first edition more yet. The first edition is another game that I think will make it to the channel at some point. Uh, I think it's fun to compare editions. I'm actually working on an edited video right now about different editions of games. And I talk about PAX Premier first edition and second edition in that, uh, as well as some other, some other kind of editions that changed kind of the core of the game when it went from first to second or second to third. I think it's interesting to, to see where things came from and to see how designers evolve their designs as they have a chance to reiterate on them. Not everyone does, right? Not, not everyone is into that sort of uh, like reiterative, iterative, reiter I don't know if reiterative is a word, but uh, I, I, not a lot of designers go back to their stuff, but a company like Sierra Madre or a guy like Cole, who in some ways is cut from that Sierra Madre cloth, uh, they, they like to go back and update things with living rules and sometimes totally new additions uh, to, see, to, to see what they can improve on those original ideas. I think that's neat, but I also think it's cool to remember where stuff came from. Uh, anyway, so I do have uh, PAX Premier 2nd Edition set up right here for uh, solo play. Now, I have not actually played the Wakan solo bot before, which is part of the reason I was not advertising this as being like, hey, come check out the PAX Premier solo play, right? Because this is not going to be an expert play. Honestly, I'm going to stumble through this. I guarantee it. But uh, I, you know, I'm going to play for a while. I'll play for probably about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes. I don't know how long it's going to take to finish. Uh, I'm, I'm looking to wrap this up right around 9 p.m. Central Time. So I will, uh, it's currently about 7.45 roughly Central Time. Uh, so we're going to, yeah, we'll play this for an hour, hour and change and see where we get. Just kind of, you know, learn how to play and mess around a little bit with the bot. Uh, bots can be neat. I actually have uh, Pericles, the GMT, uh, the GMT published game, sitting over on the side too, that has some cool solo bots that I have not yet explored, but I, I intend to in the future. And so, 
Maybe I'll do some solo stuff on the channel at some point as well, some dedicated solo games, but for the time being, why don't we stumble our way through PAX Premier 2nd Edition, uh, the Wakan solo bot. Now, I'm going to be the blue player down here. Over here is going to be the red. This will be Wakan. Uh, the game is set up already. All the cards have been laid out. I have chosen to be the Russian Allegiance to start the game, though that of course may change. For you, those of you that have played PAX Premier 2nd Edition but not really looked at Wakan at all, uh, it differs in a few ways. The core of the game is the same, but the, uh, the, the way Wakan functions has some special rules. For one, she is not uh, like an individual exactly, but rather sort of an ideology. So she can break some rules of the game because of that. For instance, she doesn't need roads to move through different regions, whereas I still do. Additionally, she can buy and play a card as a single action. It's called radicalizing. And her actions are going to be dictated by this deck of cards here. There's a, a decent number in this stack. I don't know how many, maybe like 20-ish. And so what I'm going to do to, to figure out what she does is flip over one of these cards. In fact, she takes the first turn of the game. So why don't we, you know, why don't we just go ahead and start playing and we can see uh, how, how exactly this deck works. So these are the backs of the cards, and they are part of dictating her actions. So I'm going to go ahead and flip this top one over. Now, on it are a list of a few actions that she will do in uh, preferential order. So she will start with this top action, and then uh, once she does that, she'll move to the next. And if she can't do that, she'll move to the next, and so on, kind of looping around until she's performed two actions. There's also, on this card, a bunch of arrows and a bunch of symbols that will tell you what she prefers over other things. So for instance, on the very bottom here, it's got these different uh, um, region symbols. And from left to right is her preference of targeting regions, right? So if she's going to place armies, or sorry, I'll say place roads from Persia, is it going to go from Persia to Transcaspia or is it going to go from Persia to Herat? Well, the bottom of this card will tell you how they get placed. Uh, additionally, she is not loyal to any one faction like you are, but instead her loyalty shifts kind of automatically and she can be loyal to multiple at once. So she can have a bunch of different um, uh, like loyalties represented either uh, in her court or as loyalty prizes. And even if they're different, that doesn't matter. She doesn't lose them for that purpose. So. Uh, I have the Wakan booklet. This is the main rules, but Wakan is kind of talked about in the very back. And so we'll be, uh, we'll be following that going forward. And uh, yeah, sorry for bumping that there. Oh uh, yeah, so I flipped over this top card right here. And what she's gonna do, her first preferential thing, is if Wakan has no card with the move action, radicalize a card with the move action. Well, she has no cards at all right now. So naturally, she'll radicalize a card that has the move action. Uh, if you don't know which card to pick, like if it doesn't specify a, a specific row or a specific like hierarchy of card, you reference these arrows. There's a red arrow on the bottom and a black arrow somewhere else. And then this face down card has a bunch of other stuff as well that will help uh, co correspond with those arrows. So she is going to preferentially uh, buy a card from the, uh, the bottom uh, in the second row, and she's going to take that or go left from there. Uh, in this case, this card right here in the, or sorry, this card here in the bottom, number two, bottom row, has move, and she needs a card that has the move action. So she's going to radicalize that, which again is purchasing a card, and then taking it and playing it. That is a single action, even though normally buying a card's an action and playing a card's an action for Wakan, it is combined a single action. So her second action then uh, would be move, but first I guess we have to figure, we have to finish putting all this stuff out. So she gets a spy on a card. Now she has also preference to where the spy would go, except at the moment she doesn't have a choice. Normally she'd prefer to put it, oh, oh boy. See, this is what happens when I don't have people working with me. I knock stuff over and bump into cameras. All right, there we go. Apologies, apologies. Very, very professional here at Facing Player. So uh, normally she would put the spy in my court, but I don't have anyone, so it's going to go onto Henry Pottinger. 
Uh, all right, so she's placed that, and this also is going to change the regime to move. Her next action is move, OK? So she's going to move, and she can move on this guy for free. So she can do this bonus action uh, if she, if, if she so, so, uh, so desires. And she will take bonus actions, though let me see. I want to make sure. I don't know if that, I mean, it's not going to count against her actions, but I guess she would still do it right now. So she can move uh, something right now, but there's nothing to move. There's only the spy, no armies, so moving will skip. She then goes to radicalize. So in radicalize, again, you're going to reference these arrows. So she is going to, again, bottom and row two. Uh, since she can't take that, she'll take it from this top one instead, spending her two coins there. And it goes to the right of this, again, as per the arrows on this card. This has her put two spies. They're going to go right there. Uh, so now she has performed two actions, and it will now move on to market cleanup, and then it'll be my turn. So let's go ahead and scoot these down. Slip and slide. New cards come out. All right, so what do we got here? Let's see. I have my four coins. Hmm. Well, she took, incidentally, both of the Patriots. And I was looking at those Patriots at the start because uh, I wanted this, uh, this, this Russian Patriot in Transcaspia. But instead, I think I'm going to grab this military card in the upper left here. Put that in my hand, take that coin, and then I will play. Maybe I'll just play that card straight away. And that'll switch the regime, which means she won't get those bonus actions. So, okay, yeah, I'm going to play this into here, which is going to place uh, two Russian soldiers in Punjab. Keep those a little separated. All right, uh, so those are my two actions, purchase and play. Unlike Wakan, those are separate actions for me. These all scoot, 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 and scoot. Solo games are kind of cool. I, uh, I enjoy playing solo stuff, both multi-handed and against bots like this. It, uh, I feel like, me personally anyway, I get into the theme a little more uh, in that case. It, it helps me invest myself in the theme when it's not all players. I don't see uh, Mike sitting across the table or Haley sitting across the table. You know, I see Wakan and the, the people in her pay. Uh, all right, so I've got that going. Now Wakan is going to flip over the next card. That will explain what she's going to do. So uh, first she's going to tax in a region if she can. She doesn't own any regions, so she'll skip that. Go to betray. Uh, she won't betray her own stuff. I don't think that uh, in this case uh, she'd, be, she'd be killing her cards. Um, well, actually, you know what? I think she will betray her own card. I think because there is a little hierarchy. Uh, there is a little hierarchy that she'll follow. So uh, if she goes to betray right now, uh, she would uh, take betray on the first action she could down here. She's, I believe it goes, uh, it, it follows up a priority again. But um, she, I guess, would betray her own card if she could because she would get the loyalty prize for it. But unfortunately for her, she doesn't have the betray action. So she's going to go ahead and radicalize again. And she'll actually end up potentially radicalizing twice. So uh, first, she's going to take from the bottom row in, in uh, aisle four, which she can't because she can't afford it. So then from here, you'll go left and take the first card that, you, that she could afford, which would actually be the furthest one. So she's going to take this for free and get a coin out of it. And again, radicalizing means she takes the card and plays it right away. This dictates that she'll place it to the right of her current set. And then these actions are going to go off. So she'll get two roads in Punjab. And the empire she gets it for, in this case, is not going to be Russia, even though Russia is the furthest left on this loyalty track, which this is what you follow left to right to see which uh, faction she is loyal to for this turn. She will not, however, be loyal to a faction that I'm loyal to. So she's going to move up to the Brits instead, the British. And she gets two roads in Punjab. So two British roads are going to go in Punjab. But they need to go along these two lines. 
There are only two, so it'll be easy to figure out where they go. It'll be both of them. But just for procedure, she's going to check the symbols of the regions, which these all have symbols printed underneath, uh, as well as on these tokens, which uh, the tokens might be hard to see from, from this camera right now. But she's going to place one first on this uh, sort of, I don't know, it's like a trapezoid sort of thing. I'm not sure what, what symbol that is, but it's this one. It's Kabal, or Kabul, rather. So she's going to place one road here, and the next one is circle, but she's not adjacent to this circle. She is the circle. Uh, so the next is the square, which is Kandahar. So she's going to put that road there. So she gets these two roads hanging out. Uh, all right, so then can she tax? Uh, once again, to tax a region, you have to have some ownership, and she does not have ownership yet. She doesn't have the betray action, so it's going to go back to radicalize. She's going to radicalize something. Uh, and it's going to be the same situation. She won't be able to radicalize any of these. The only card she could radicalize... Actually, she could radicalize with this one. I take it back, because she got a coin. So uh, this coin will go here, and then she'll take this. Putting it all the way to the right, which will set her up like that. And she got that coin off of it. All right, so we've got these cards under Wakan now. And unfortunately, she has exceeded her uh, court size. She's got two more of these, and I understand I'm taking these off in like a backwards way right now. Uh, she's got two cards, or uh, one too many cards in her court. She can have three plus uh, however many purple cards she has. And as it stands right now, she doesn't have any purple cards, so she has too many. Uh, in cleanup, she will discard stuff from her hand, just like anyone else. And she's got a priority list over here uh, on this card as well for discarding stuff. So the first thing she's going to discard uh, are non-political cards. None of these are political, so no issue. Then it's non-patriot cards, which one of these two will be discarded because these are both patriots. Then a non-leveraged card. Uh, none of these are leveraged. Uh, and then the most player spies that have more than Wakan spies. Uh, there are no player spies on these. Then it's the card with the fewest spies, period, which is this Kyber Pass. So she's going to discard the Kyber Pass card over to there. And now she's within her limit. All right, so refresh this market. Send out two more cards. All right, so back to my turn. Let me see here. What just came out? That free card in the upper left is attractive because I get money for it. It's also going to hook me up with a bunch of roads. And they're in Herat, which is not super useful yet. What I need are roads out of Punjab to move some of these armies around. But maybe beyond that, what I need are tribes. So I see my boy Dost Muhammad hanging out over here. And he could go, he, he, could, he could hook me up with some stuff in this region. So that might be my buy. That might be my best purchase, because he's going to give me an army, a spy, and two tribes, which is awesome. It's going to give me rulership in Kabul, and uh, hopefully, let's see, are there other Kabul cards out, though? There's this one up here, which is nice. That'll let me tax. And there's also this guy down here who uh, he actually has a nice ability that allows me to tax any region as though I owned it, which could be useful. But I think for right now, because I want to get some tribes out, I want to catch up to the number of cylinders that Wakan has put out. So I'm going to spend a dollar and pick up Dost Muhammad. Also, actually, I'm sorry, this, this should have switched it back to this. I forgot to play that impact action earlier. And so after that, I will let's see. Geez, this is tricky. I've been playing. I've been playing a lot more transhumanity and um, transhumanity and uh, Renaissance lately. Getting back into Pamir is. It's surprising how much like the central system can actually change depending on the depending on the specific game. I think I'll hang on to Dost Muhammad for the time being and pick up this card too because I want this money. 
I find that getting a nice financial advantage is, uh, is key in a lot of these games. So I'm gonna go ahead and pick both those up. Uh, and then I'm gonna go ahead and slip and slide all these down, ending my turn. And now that I have a bunch of cash, I can start to look at some of these events. Uh, all right, move on to Wakan. Let's flip over Wakan's card. And it's again, same tax, betray, and radicalize. Unfortunately, she does not have tax or betray still, so it's just gonna be, at least right now, a radicalize before doing anything else. So she only has a buck once more, and she wants to radicalize the bottom row. It would be the second row here, but she doesn't have the cash for that. She can afford this one, though. And so I think that is the one she would end up buying. Uh, she favors, she first goes for, uh, it would be the card, again, based on what that lists. But once she can, let me see here, let me make sure I'm doing that right for buying things. Yeah, keeping Wakan cash poor, that's, that, that's, I think, feel like when I play this game in general, I try to keep my opponents cash poor by picking up as much as I can. It, that usually leads to me having a slow start, but then later on I sort of have free reign of the market. Uh, if, I, if, if you can leverage that, I think it's pretty good. So, yeah, so Wakan will purchase from that column. If it's not a valid choice, pick the next valid card to its left. Uh, and then, yes, and then you switch back to the original position in the other row. So, she's going to be buying from the bottom and row number two. Or, uh, sorry, uh, row bottom column two. So, it'd be this one right here. She can't afford it. So then she moves left to here, which she can afford. So let's throw that on there, pick this one up, and it goes uh, on the right again. So over there, that's going to give some money to Wakan, plus a couple of other things. So first she gets a couple of roads in Persia for the British. And they're going to go first to here, and then the next one's going to be to there. And then she gets two coins from the bank, because this card is leveraged. And it's going to switch the regime to intelligence. And then uh, she still doesn't have tax. She still doesn't have betray. So she'll radicalize again. And uh, that's going to be this card over here. Because again, actually, you know what? She, she has two coins now, so she can't afford this. So she will purchase it. It's going to go there, there, pick up that card, and it's an event. So uh, backing of Persian uh, aristocracy, take three rupees from the bank. Straight away, basically just got her a dollar. Spent two to take three. Made her a little more cash, cash uh, rich than before. And then these all slide on down. I'm feeling pretty good right now. I'm feeling all right about Wakan. Uh, actually, you know what? She has a discarded card too, so hang on. Let's hide that for a sec. Uh, so, once again, she doesn't have the, the requisite court size. So non-political, it's going to be one of these. Non-patriot, non-leveraged, that would be this one. So, these come back. Charles Mason is gone. And then, we're going to go ahead and flip these out. Hmm, hmm, hmm. So, I have two cards in my hand, so I'm not going to be able to play anymore right now, because I don't have any blue cards in my court. So let's go ahead and stick Dost Muhammad out right now. Let's actually put him over here for the time being. I'll scoot these a little. So we have Dost Muhammad, who's going to give me a pair of tribesmen over there. Just going to let me rule this, because I'm also going to drop a Russian army and a spy in Kabul. She doesn't have any Kabul, so it's going to, I guess, have to go there. But that's fine. It's not a big deal. Dost Muhammad doesn't have any abilities. He pretty much just hooks me up with a bigger court size uh, and the impact actions that he initially provides. So my one action is going to be playing Dost Muhammad. And then I don't have any armies I can do anything with right now because... Well, actually, I do have these Russian armies. I could destroy these roads. Hmm. Though the roads, the roads aren't going to change too much because Wakan can move without roads. 
So I could battle and destroy these, but I don't know that I care enough to right now. Let's see. Hey Dan, yeah, it's um, uh, Pax Premier is cool. I, I wish I wish I could play it more. I end up getting down these stupid uh, these stupid rabbit holes of games like Insecta and Cave Evil and whatever else, uh, and I, I end up ignoring what are probably better games. Well, uh, that's not true. Cave Evil is a very cool game. Cave Evil, it, like I said, is up there. Uh, Cave Evil's up there as one of my favorite games right now. It's it's kind of the only thing I really want to be playing. I'm trying to plan a game for it uh, this week. We were going to play tomorrow, but uh, it might not happen now. Um, but yeah, Pax Premier is very cool. I'm, I'm a big fan of it. And I, uh, yeah, just need to find more time to play it. Honestly, uh, starting up Phasing Player is giving me more excuse to play more games. Uh, we, we have a game night like once a week and sometimes work in extras, like we played 1889 uh, this last week sort of as an extra thing. We played Cosmic Encounter on our game night, and we played 1889, uh, I think it was like the day before. And um, yeah, I, 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 I've been trying to find more time in my life for games, and doing phasing player has been kind of an impetus, uh, not impetus, an excuse rather, to, uh, to play more, uh, more games. And weirder games. I, I convince myself that I'm gonna, you know, spend money on a rare, expensive thing. I like, oh, I'll, I'll do a video for it for the channel. Uh, that's like the excuse now to buy games. Uh, but I'm, I, 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 yes, Dan, Pax Premier is a cool game. Uh, that's what I was getting at. Uh, Cave Evil is out of print. It is out of print at the moment, and I, I'll say I got a very good deal on Cave Evil. Uh, I um, I ended up picking up I ended up picking up uh, Cave Evil and it's like sort of sequel sort of expansion War Cults uh, and I got the pair of them for just over a hundred bucks which I which was a steal that, that was a crazy good deal I'm very happy about that all right let's see we've got uh, sorry I lost well, I lost my train of thought here so it's my turn I played Dost Muhammad. Let's let's spend some of this money. So my quality lost this train of thought. Yeah, my wife, my wife Haley just walked in. She's uh she's popping up right back here from a bike ride. Say hello, sweetheart. Hey, hey sweetheart. Hi, <laughs> hi, you're funny. Uh she uh she distracted me from my, my plans here. So I have a bunch of money. I've got six bucks on me. Let's see, what does this event do? Choose a suit to favor. All favored suit change impact icons are ignored until the next dominance check. Mm, it seems all right, but maybe not what I need exactly right now. The Persian army could help me. Persian army would give me some dudes in Persia. Shouldn't be surprising. But what I need is going to be more... I, I'm going to need Russian loyalty. Because as it stands right now, if, if, a, if a, a dominance card comes up, I, uh, the, the Russians would be dominant at the moment, I believe. Uh, actually, uh, no, never mind. The Russians would not be dominant at the moment. But if I can get them dominant, I still need more prestige or more um, influence than Wakhan. And Wakhan has one Russian influence right now, which is equal to mine. So I'd like to get some more uh, Russian patriots going. Oh, let me see. Let me see what I can do. I want to put out some more Russian blocks. So maybe that's where killing these roads could help. If I kill these roads, that won't put the Russians ahead, but it'll help them ahead. Or I could play the Faro Road, this card I have, uh, because this would hook me up with three more Russian coalition blocks out there. And that could be okay. It would also be uh, around Herat, so I could kind of connect all these. Which would allow which would allow my my massive one Russian army in Kabul to march around. Maybe that's that maybe that's the move. Maybe the move is to uh, to go hook that up. Or ooh, I actually I also see these um, Giselle sharpshooters that have betray, and I have a spy. So maybe if I picked that up, I could use Hari Singh Nalwa to move this spy and assassinate Henry Pottinger. Because Henry Pottinger is a Russian loyalty prize. 
So if I can go have my boy Dost Muhammad travel across the globe to kill Henry Pottinger over in Punjab, that would give me not only a loyalty prize, which would let me outnumber Wakhan in Russian loyalty, or I would uh, maybe potentially start... Oh God, this is tricky. This is hard. This is what I like about solo games is I'm not wasting other people's time. I can just sit here and talk, kind of think out loud uh, about what I'm trying to do. Uh, without without having to kind of give away my plans. Uh, and I'll say this, I'll say this. Doing this uh, on, on a stream like this with, with a, a, an audience in front of me is nice because I feel like I'm talking to people then. Now, I do talk to myself when I play solo games on my own anyway, as my wife will attest. I will talk to myself or my cats or whoever, uh, but I feel a little less uh, uh, out of line with, with people here. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to go back and figure out what I'm going to do. Stop delaying my action. Uh, okay, Sean Roberts. Yes. Okay. So they are. Uh, they have two. They have two. Right. I forgot that. I forgot that they got it for. They had a base of one for everyone. So I am going to. Uh, yeah. I'm. I'm going to spend a couple bucks. I'm actually going to do it. On. Yeah. Let's. Let's do it over here. I'm putting even more money on this free card, and I'm picking up Giselle Sharpshooters. Because my plan, and I'm probably an idiot, but my plan is going to be to attempt to uh, run this spy around and murder Henry Pottinger. But we'll, we'll, we'll see if that works out. We'll see if it works out. So my two actions are playing Dost Muhammad and then buying up uh, Giselle Sharpshooters. Uh, now we are in uh, the, the intelligence, and so I don't have any free, freebie actions in intelligence right now. So let's go ahead and scoot these bad boys down. Oh, right. Uh, and uh, Overboard Games, I'm happy that you, uh, you were able to uh, learn Pax Transhumanity from my, my tutorial video. It's, um, it's a cool game. It's, it's, it's a real neat game, and it is definitely up there with probably Pax Renaissance as my favorite Pax game. Uh, though, again, I, I'm not trying to discount Premiere at all. It's a very good game. Uh, very attractive, too. I, I, as everyone has said, I, everybody says it. Pax Premiere, second edition, is a super attractive game. Anyway, back to Wakan. Let's flip this card over, see what she's going to do. So radicalize a card that'll gain Wakan control of a region. So in order to do that, she's going to need tribes to control a region. And she has a couple of options for tribes. She has a couple of options for tribes. So uh, she's going to go, uh, again, she's going to check her, uh, her, her row here. She's going to go top row. And ideally, she's going to purchase in the second card, so this one. will not give her a tribe, though. And she's going to need a tribe to dominate a region, or to take control of it, I should say. So moving one left over here is going to hook her up with this card for free. It goes to the left of her pile, so we're going to scoot these down a little bit. Slide all this over. Trying to sort of keep Wakan's stuff like, kind of keep this like a gap so I don't mix my cards with her cards. We'll see how long that lasts. Uh, I'll have to put some marker or something later. Anyway, so she picks up this card here. It's going to give her that plus a British, more British, army in that region. She now rules Herat. And the way I like to, so I think the way the rules are written, you're supposed to take these tokens kind of into your area when you rule a spot. Uh, for me personally, I think that it is hard to associate some of these symbols with a region, unless you're like, you immediately know, oh, the one with a bunch of stars is Persia, or the square one is Kandahar. So what I like to do is place a tribe from the ruling region on top of that token, because you're always going to have to have a tribe there to dominate that region, right? And then it's immediately obvious who dominates what. So I know I have this thing here, that means I dominate Kabul. Uh, uh, Wakan has this in Herat, that means she dominates Herat. It's kind of a quick easy to notice um, um, visual indicator versus taking the token. My, my, my preference, but just so you guys know what I'm doing, it is not what the rules say, but it's what I like to do. Anyway, so she hooked that up. She radicalized a card that'll gain her control of a region. She got control of her rot. Uh, and then she's going to battle, if possible. She does have an army here uh, to battle with, but uh, I don't think she can kill her own stuff. So she will radicalize again. And I'm going to make sure she can't kill her own stuff. 
uh, when she battles where another player has pieces and she has an army. So yeah. Uh, and they're, they're, she doesn't have spies in any region yet. So yes, so she's, she's gonna go ahead and uh, radicalize once more. So to radicalize, uh, it's again gonna be top row, second card, that sucker there. And she can afford it. She uh, absolutely can afford it. So let's go ahead and drop those suckers. Pick up this Persian card, it's gonna go to the left. <laughs> bum, 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 bum. So I, um, I don't know how many of you guys watching are wrestling fans. <laughs> I, uh, I, I am a, I'm a pretty big wrestling fan. I, um, I watch uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling is what I watch, and they, this is probably going to go beyond a lot of what most of you care about, so I'll be brief. But I've been watching uh, the big Japanese wrestling show um, of the year, which was yesterday and the day before and um, just the, the music on the show has been stuck in my head like all day long. And so if I, if I start humming or like, kind of whistling a tune, it's probably that, and I apologize if it's, if it's a problem. Uh, but anyway, so uh, Wakan radicalized this card here. That is going to uh, place a couple of armies in Persia, way down here. And she's got roads, which again, she doesn't need them, but visually I'm seeing a ton of pink on the map, which is a pain. And uh, so she's got the Persian army, it's going to switch to intelligence, but it's already intelligence. And uh, that is going to be her turn. Now, she's got one, two, three, four, five cards. She can hold a base of three plus one because of the Hazara chiefs. And so uh, she will have to lose one. Let's go ahead and take a look here. Non-political, so not these. Uh, sorry, non-political, so not this one. Non-patriot, so not these. Non-leveraged, so not this. That's going to very quickly tell me it's the one she just bought, this, this Persian army. So Persian army goes away. And let's go ahead and refresh the row. It's kind of interesting doing, uh, doing solo games with bots because it's, it feels like a puzzle. It feels like you are trying to uh, like sort of suss out like the, the, the exact solution you need. Because you can see, like I can look and see like you know what she's about to do and, and kind of the, the way she's leaning with stuff, how much money she has, knowing that she's gonna have to buy, probably in many cases, have to buy a card from a row. If she has no money, she's gonna go for a cheap one. Uh, it does emulate kind of how real players play in a lot of ways, but there's like a, a mechanical feel to it almost that you can, yeah, sort of puzzle out in some capacity. This uh, deck of cards, uh, flipping over can kind of throw that off a little bit because you don't know what she's going to try to do immediately. But um, yeah, it's, it's kind of neat. And I did play the, uh, the PAX Premier first edition bot a couple of times too in the past uh, and had a good time with it. But I think this one, so far, this one seems a little more sophisticated than that. Uh, and Ottawa Jason, yes, no, no uh, I'm, I'm happy to be doing it. I'm hoping you get some value out of it, even if I'm stumbling my way a little bit through this at the moment. Okay, so a dominance check card came out. Oh, and someone asked before about seeing the, um, some of the stained pieces I've done up close. I, uh, I have this camera up on a tripod right now. I'm not going to show them in the moment, but before I sign off, and like I said, I'm signing off around 9 p.m. my time, so it's about 40 minutes from now. I apologize for not you know, doing a full-on game of this. Uh, probably, I doubt this is going to finish in 40 minutes, but who knows, there's a dominance card out. Um, but I, uh, I, I, will, I will pop it off the tripod or, or you know, get a close-up on my main camera and uh, show some of the stained pieces a bit more. They, I think I could do a bit better of a job, but I do think they look pretty good. I'm happy with them, certainly. Anyway, so uh, Wakan's taking her turn, it's now my turn. This dominance check is out. And the funny thing about these dominance checks and the situation we're in right now is the Brits are dominant. I have no loyalty in the British. And so she would gain enough points to have a solo victory, like immediately. So this game could suddenly end really, really quickly. And that would not be ideal. So let me think here about what I want to do. I kind of think... I kind of think I need to shift my loyalty. I kind of think I need to shift my loyalty to the British if only to, oh, excuse me, uh, if only 
to stop myself from auto losing in a moment. Uh, so, because if, well, she won't have the money to buy this, but, you know, I'm guessing she's going to pick up some of those big ones if I don't. So, I have four bucks. I could pick up Arthur Connolly. If I pick up Arthur Connolly over here, that'll cost me two. I could then play him. I could also pick up William, William Hay, McNaughton. If I do that and play them, that will stop me from uh, uh, not being a, a British patriot, and therefore I'll get some points come the dominance check. Or, hmm, or I could try to start knocking out some of these British pieces with these armies, because I could kill this road and this road. And then that would, there, there would be no dominance then for the Brits. And we would just get points based on our, our cylinders. Ay ay ay. So, I kind of still want to go ahead with my plan of getting this guy over to Harry Pottinger too. We have intelligence right now. Ah, oh, geez Louise. I gotta stop Wakan from getting cash, though, because Wakan can't afford the dominance. So I'm going to go against my better judgment here. I'm going to play first, because I'm going to have a full hand in a moment. Uh, I'm going to play these, this road card, this uh, Farah road, and I'll drop it over here. I'm going to play this, which is going to hook me up with three roads, three Russian roads around Herat. So we're gonna go here, we're gonna go here, and you know what, I need some mobility, so I'm actually gonna drop two here, so that this army can't completely get rid of this connection. And then, my second action is gonna be to pick up this giant, giant stack of fat rupees over here. Okay. Those are my two moves. I'm hoping I'm doing all right. Thank you, Kate. I appreciate the, uh, the encouragement. All right, and now we got Muhammad Shah out there. All right, well, here we go, Wakan. Wakan's next action. So first thing she would do, if she has fewer than two rupees, which she does, radicalize the cards that would get her the most rupees. Oof, I'm happy that I picked up this giant bank because she would have just taken all that right there with that card. Because uh, that is her priority action. So she has fewer than two rupees. She's going to radicalize this card way up here. I'm sorry, I'm blocking the view with my hat. Uh, these fruit markets, and it's going to go to the right side for her. So that gets her three. It's going to drop a road for the Russians. No, so the Afghans uh, in Kandahar. Kandahar being right here. And it's going to go uh, into... The next one would be up to Kabul. Oh, you're right. Oh, you're right. I do have to pay. I, I forgot that she ruled Herat. Thank you for that. Thank you for that note. Uh, I do have to pay. She has a tribe, so I'm going to pay one. Uh, which actually, oh, well, let me back up. Yes, thank you. Thank you for noting that. I, I was getting in my own head here and forgot. So let's back up. Let's back up this turn. No road for the Afghans. She does not uh, take that card, which had two coins on it. Yes, yes, I do need to pay her bribe. So uh, I will pay. Thank you, Dan, for that heads up. So when I uh, played that card, I will have to pay Wakan because she rules Herat. So she has a tribe. I have to pay a rupee. That goes to her. Now, that was on my turn. Now it's her turn. Her first thing, if she has fewer than two rupees, she does not have fewer than two rupees anymore because of that bribe. So she now will go down to the next level, which is build, and she does have a build action available. So she is going to build uh, in either Transcaspia or Persia, because that is where the build action is. And uh, she goes down again this priority list to see where exactly she's going to build. And the list starts with, uh, if it's an opponent's card, which, uh, actually sorry, she doesn't, for, for build she doesn't do that, she does it in this order down here. So uh, she's going to build in, preferably between Transcaspia and Persia, it would be Transcaspia. So she's going to build in Transcaspia. Sorry, but I'll back up on that again to say what I was, I was saying wrong. So she has this list of priorities when you have to figure out what she does with a card. 
if it's she'll prioritize it being an opponent's card, which really only comes up if there's a spy involved for betrayal or you know something to that effect. After that check, then she'll do something on a matching favored suit. After that, if it's the Patriot of the Dominant Coalition, it's sort of a list that you'll go down for a bunch of her actions. I didn't look. I defaulted to that for build. That's not true for build. Uh, for build, it is the order of um, the regions listed on her card. And uh, the favored regions, she has two places she can build in Transcaspia or Persia. And in, uh, in, in the order on the bottom of the card, tran this Transcaspian logo comes before the Persian logo. So she's going to build in Transcaspia. She'll spend as much money as she can. She has two rupees. A basic build action, building one thing, will be two rupees. So she's going to go ahead and uh, spend those to the end of the market. Then uh, she will build over there, and she will build armies. Preferably, she builds armies. So she'll build an army in Transcaspia. OK, cool. After build, she has no more money. She will then radicalize. She radicalizes the bottom row, and it'll be the uh, bottom row number one. So it'd be this, which she can't afford, so she then moves to the left of in that row until she can afford something, which is going to be this card right here. She will radicalize it, which is taking it and playing it. And again, this AI card dictates if she puts it to the left or the right, it says to the right. So she'll drop that right there, which is going to give her one of these suckers in Kabul. I still rule this region, thankfully, because I have uh, these two. Actually, you know what? Let me take a look here, because she actually would have to pay my bribe now to put that down. So let me see if she can do that, because I rule the region, and she doesn't have money. Uh, I believe she does still have to pay the cost to me, like the, the bribes to me. Yeah, so she has to, she has to be able to do it. And she cannot. So, backing this up, she will instead radicalize this card. Because if th this row doesn't have anything valid, she would then go to the next one in the other row based on where the position this says. So this said, bottom row first Sorry, yeah, bottom, bottom row, first column. So then my second check would start in the top row, first column, going left until she can afford it, which would be this one. And again, radicalizes buy and play. She couldn't play that Kabul card because she couldn't afford my, my bribe. So she'll play that into Kandahar, which drops one of these roads in Kandahar, which is hanging out here. And it is going to preferentially go to Kabul. All right, so uh, we got that taken care of. She built and she uh, dropped a road and switched this to that other regime. All right, moving this down, which makes the dominance check cheaper, and I don't like that because she still can't afford it. It's going to be a bit till she can, but I, yeah, I need to focus on getting, getting myself into a better position as far as dominance goes. The dream, of course, is I'm, I'm in a spot where I can win four points from one dominance check and just crush Wakan. All right, so I've got these Giselle sharpshooters in my hand still. I've got, I've got two move actions. No, none of them are free, so I can, I can move this sucker to three and then betray that next turn maybe. She doesn't have any betray actions, so I'm not worried about that now. There's also, there's one betray in the market available, but it's expensive, so she can't afford it. If I purchase that dominance check right now, no, no one is dominant, and so we would check cylinders, which would get her uh, a few points and me a single point, which is not ideal. It would her three, me one. So I want to get myself in a better position for that dominance check. I could, this will give me a spy, this card here, which could be nice, because that'll tie us up, which means we would each get two points in the dominance. 
because you add the, them together and split them evenly. Or if I could play that guy, I could try to battle her spy as well. Or march down here and battle this tribe, which could be slick. Hmm, choices, choices, choices. I think I'm gonna try to stick with my original plan here because this is gonna help my Russian armies. It's gonna give me another spy in Kandahar, which I could just drop over here. Let's do that, let's, let's hook that up because I'm still within my hand limit. I guess actually she's not within her hand limit. She would have to have gotten rid of, uh, let's see, non-leverage, so it'd be this one. She would have gotten rid of that at the end of her turn because uh, of her hand limit being four at the moment because of that guy. Oh yeah, we're playing Gis Giselle Sharpshooters. That's the move right now. That's gonna drop two Ruskies in Kandahar and it'll give me a spy in Kandahar, which is not gonna go there anymore, but I'll put him there, that's fine. <sighs> okay, and then I could go ahead and march around just to get into regions. I'd love more roads right now. Oh, I could bribe her to put a road in her rot right here because I have that this card. And I still have, I'm still good down there. If I killed her, I could also assassinate this which would overthrow that guy. Maybe focus on doing that in a bit. Let's, I don't want to move these too much more. And the Brits are not dominant. So let's let's go ahead and drop this, but I'm gonna put it on this other side as to give my spy in Kandahar a little more room to move around. So we're gonna play him there in Herat. We are gonna have to bribe her again. That's fine. I'll live with that. And that's gonna give me a road in Herat, which I'm dropping here. Move these out a little bit more. And then I'm going to also get an army in Herat. I'm just gonna go right there. So I feel like that puts me in a pretty good spot. I actually feel in pretty good now about this Russian influence because I have uh, two battle options as it stands. And so next turn, I might use both of those. This one's a double battle and this is a single battle. I might use those, maybe double here to kill these roads and then single here to kill this army or her tribe. Uh, and I think that'll put me in a pretty pretty tight spot, uh, good, in a good way, a good tight spot. Uh, so great, let's move on to Wakan. So Wakan flips this over, first builds. She has money, and the preference is going to be between Transcaspia and Persia again. It is going to be Transcaspia once more. So she's going to build an army in Transcaspia for the Afghans. It'll be the Russians first, but because I'm Russian, she won't do it for my loyalty. Her second choice was the Afghans, and that is again in Transcaspia. Then, uh, her next option is move. So she does have move actions. So she's gonna be end up moving these suckers, I think. So again, favored region to move from uh, is going to be first, looks like out of here, but she, let's see. She only moves armies and does not require any roads to facilitate it. When moving, try to move her armies to adjacent regions where other players have tribes, using region priority on AI card to determine the choice between equally viable origins and destinations. She will seek to have only as many armies as there are tribes in that region. Wakan will not move armies if doing so would cause her to lose her ruler token. Okay. She moves armies and does not require roads to facilitate that movement. All right, all right. Oh, and she will always take the highest priority card uh, when given that choice for, for most actions. Okay, so since she's loyal to all of these, let me take a look at pragmatic loyal loyalty again. Is always loyal to the leftmost card that is not shared by another player. Okay, so yeah, so she will, so she'll, uh, she'll still move Afghan armies. So it would be this one, it would be this set. So she would uh, preferentially move from Transcaspia and her, her number one choice would be to Herat. And she doesn't need roads. So she's gonna march these both down here. 
Uh, all right, and uh, so she's built and she's moved. Those are her two actions, and, uh, and they were not free. So she doesn't she doesn't get any bonus actions. Moves back to me. Okay, I'm feeling all right now because I think if I can kill this, that'll kill that for her. Hmm. <laughs> or I can start to battle because if I battle, ooh, actually, hold on a second. Russia is doing really well right now. So if I can battle, that'd make them dominant, but I still need to knock her down lower than two, lower than two influence in Russia for me to take advantage of that. And there are no Russian patriots out there for me to grab. There are a bunch of British patriots though. Do I shift? Maybe I should shift to the Brits. Make a shift to the British, use some of my battling ability with maybe this sucker to kill a Russian. And then maybe, hmm. The only reason I'm thinking of switching to the British is because there are so many British patriots. There are three out there right now, which could give me the most influence in the British. And I think that might be my quickest path to victory. Like, I, I, Russia is dominating the map right now, but there's just not a lot of Russian influence out there. Like, I could, I guess I could assassinate my own Giselle sharpshooters or try to go assassinate Henry Pottinger. If I can do both of those, that would give me more than, than Wakhan has. And I, the Russian armies are out there. I've put in work here. I can use those Russian armies to force Russian dominance. I only have two spies. Heesh, okay. Let me think here, let me think here. <sighs> choices, choices, choices. Sorry, I'm being quiet here for a second. <sighs> okay. Let's move. Let's take the move action first in, I guess it would have to be in Punjab to avoid paying any fees. So let's do that. Let's have this sucker move to Herat with this move action. I can move two spaces actually. Maybe I can move here and do an assassinate. This is going to get rid of that, though, which is nice. But I need the loyalty. No, I'm, I'm, I'm going for the throat here. So I'm moving two with the spy. I'm going uh, from Giselle Sharpshooters. I'm going one, two over to there. My second action is going to be taking the Giselle Sharpshooters action um, betray. I'm spending two bucks, and I'm going to betray. I'm going to kill Henry Pottinger, which is going to return both of these to our sheets. And I'll claim Ol' Henry here as a loyalty prize because he has this yellow band underneath. Uh, I'm just going to stick him over here upside down to remember that I've got that. So that kills Henry Pottinger, uh, which is going to be great for me in terms of getting points, getting loyalty. Those are my two moves. And uh, now it's Wakan's turn again. She is going to radicalize the highest ranked political card which is one, they're, they're all one, and uh, if there's a tie, I think she breaks with her preferences, her priorities. So let's see, follow them, ties are dictated by the cheapest card in the market with the highest numbered card breaking further ties. So the cheapest one in the market is gonna be the zero down here, and she's gonna drop it on the right side. So uh, Shah Shunja Durrani, is what she gets. She gets one sucker in Kabul. She, oh, actually, uh, Kabul. I, I keep, keep forgetting to look at uh, the cost here. She can't actually do that because she can't afford my bribe. She only has one buck. So uh, she could not afford to radicalize any political card there. So moving on, if military cards are favored, she does not, she, military cards are not favored, so she will simply radicalize the bottom 
uh, third row. So bottom row, third column would be this one, moving left. This is the cheapest she can afford in Transcaspia. She'll pay that dollar and pick him up, playing him to the right. Ole Arthur Connolly. Move some of these over. Arthur Connolly is going to hook her up with a single spy, which the place it would go would be first, uh, it would have to go in Transcaspia somewhere, which uh, this is really the only option. So it's going to be this one or this one. And I think when she places a spy, she does have preference to where it goes. Uh, and it is going to be my, the opponent's card if possible. Otherwise, it matches the favored suit. After that, it's a patriot of the dominant coalition, which is Russian, so it would be him. All right. After that, so she has uh, done one action, which is radicalize. She has no money. And she will next uh, go back to the top of the row, which is radicalize the highest ranked political card. Once again, she cannot. Uh, military cards are favored. They're not. Back to radicalize the bottom row, which would be this that she can't do. She actually can't do either of those actions. And if she's unable to do either action, if, hmm, I don't actually know what she does if she can't perform either action because she can't afford either of those cards because I rule Kabul and she can't afford to pay me. So let's see, what could happen? Brown arrows, which column to purchase from. If the card is not a valid choice, pick the next valid one to the left. After purchase, if she cannot pay the bribe, she'll, oh, then she just discards the card. Okay, cool. So she would buy this and toss it because she can't afford my bribe. Uh, all right, and all this slips on down. I'm sure I'm getting some minutia wrong with this bot. I feel like I'm mostly getting it right, but I'm, I'm sure I'm missing a couple of flowcharty things. All right, so now I have this one sucker here. I can still afford that dominance check, but I need to kill this fella right here. Or pick up. Or, yeah, or I need another Russian loyalist so I could assassinate my Giselle sharpshooters. Because hooking up those, uh, killing those Giselle sharpshooters will give me another Russian influence, which would be lovely. That would put me in a great spot. Hmm. Can a card assassinate itself? I guess I don't see why not. So, yeah, unless I learn later that I've cheated, I think what I'm going to do is have... Um, my dude in Punjab move this guy over too, and then I'm gonna have the uh, Giselle sharpshooters sharpshoot themselves, killing this, spending two bucks, and uh, taking that loyalty. So I've got two Russian loyalty cards over here now. Those are discarded. Two Russian loyalty. So now I have three Russian loyalty versus Wakan's two, which means if I can uh, pick this up, I'll, I'll or the, uh, the this up. I'll get some extra points because Russia is dominant. Russia is dominant in the uh, in the coalition blocks. Uh, cool. So that was, that was my turn. Wakan, what are you doing? Radicalize the card that would put the most armies and or roads. Well, this one would put the most armies, but she can't afford it. That one would put the most roads, and she can't afford it. So she will do that. Uh, no, because she, once again, she can't. She can't afford my bribe, but I think she still does it. So she would. Let me let me see here. I guess it wouldn't place the most roads though, because she would discard it because she can't afford my bribe. If no coalition has dominance, Russia has dominance. No, Russia does not yet have dominance. They're close. Uh, radicalize the card that would place the most spies or tribes. Uh, well, this would place the most spies. 
and she buys from the bottom row first. So yeah, I think she would buy this one, putting it to the right, and it would add two spies in Kandahar, uh, which would just end up being right there. It's the only spot they can go. Gives her two bucks from the bank. Yeah, uh, Pax Premier is neat. It, it did take a little bit to wrap my head around, uh, uh, Fred. I had played several Pax games before this, including the original Pax Premier, uh, so that helped. But learning kind of the different systems, especially in some ways it hurt because I kept remembering systems from Pax Premier first edition, trying to apply it to second edition. And uh, that got me in trouble a couple of times. Anyway, so she played William Hay McNaughton. She got her, her uh, two spies. She got her two bucks from it being a leveraged card. And then she will radicalize, just regular radicalize as the next move. So it's row, uh, um, bottom row, second column would be this card, which she can now afford. So bing, bing, pick up this sucker and drop it over to the right. Scoot her cards over once more. Playing with a little bit of limited space here, so a lot of card moving going on. The Army of the Indus. The Army of the Indus is going to hook her up with three British dudes in Punjab. Hmm. Okay. So those are her two moves. Uh, as far as freebies, she will take some freebie actions now because she can here. When it comes to bonus actions with Wakan, uh, she will... Uh, She'll start with the left most unused card and take the left most action on the card, skipping actions that can't be taken. So in Herat, because we're in a political rule, uh, she can take a free action from the uh, Hazara chiefs. The Hazara chiefs will first battle in Herat if possible. Well, she will battle in Herat, so that's going to be the free action they take. And uh, they will battle, I believe, preferentially um, my my tribe first. But that's not my tribe, so she won't battle it. She won't kill her own. Let's see. Uh, she will destroy tribes, armies, and roads in that order. So tribes, armies, and roads in that order. So she will destroy one of these roads, and the road she will destroy, or sorry, army rather, armies first. So the army she will destroy is going to go down this chart again. Um, uh, dominant coalition. I believe is going to be first. So she will, uh, I guess that's not Dom. Let me, let me see here. Uh, yeah, Dan, I, I ended up um, coming to the same conclusion as far as a spy betraying itself. It seems kind of weird, like the Giselle sharpshooters shoot themselves, but I'm sure you could come up with some political reason or some, some sort of kind of fringe theory as to why that could happen. Uh, so I will certainly take advantage of that fact right now. So let's see. When she battles, leftmost region, once the region is chosen, destroy tribes, armies, and roads in that order. She will battle against the highest priority court card where she and another player has spies, which she doesn't. If multiple players can be targeted in a battle action, use the red arrow to determine which player is targeted. Is the red arrow to determine which player is targeted? I guess that's for spies. But which army will she destroy there? Or rather, will she? Yeah, will she destroy the the Afghan army or will she destroy the Russian army? That one I'm not immediately clear on. Which actions? Look at the center actions. Blah blah blah. Hmm. Dominance check. Otherwise, do this thing as for purchasing cards. Spies and roads. Instructions to be true. Yeah, and battle. Battle in a region where another player has pieces. Oh, did, I'm, I'm an idiot. I'm skipping right over it. She will battle another player, and uh, pieces loyal to me are considered 
player pieces for Wakan. So because I am loyal to Russia, she will battle Russian pieces first. Okay, that makes sense. So she battles that with this British army uh, and her single battle action. She has no more free actions. I apologize for that delay in looking up that rule. Like I said, I'm sh I was sure I'd stumble through this a little bit. I have not done this bot before. So uh, she battled there and that would be her free action after taking her turn. So now it's my turn once we refresh this market. Now, I am probably going to do two things here. I'm going to pick up that dominance check if I can uh, get rid of a couple of these Brits, which I think I can. Uh, and then I'll perch and then uh, and then after that, that might be the end of this stream. Uh, we're rounding nine o'clock right now. I think a dominance check's probably a good time to to kind of it's a good ending point because it's going to clear this. And um, yeah, we'll go from there. So. First thing I'm going to do is battle. I'm going to battle the... I'm actually... Hmm, that's actually going to be tricky because I don't know if something's going to be dominant. That might actually hurt me by that because if I kill two of these, the Russians still don't have enough out after killing that. So I can battle a second time. And if I battle a second time... The next turn, perhaps I could purchase that. So let's battle in Punjab. All right, so yeah, let's battle in Punjab. Uh, it's a double battle action on um, Hari Singh Nalwa. So we're gonna have these suckers kill these armies. With that first action, drop those in there. And then I will maybe I could purchase something to give me more battles. Or I could just do a single battle and then maybe next turn try to flip it. So we're just going to do a single battle uh, having this dude kill this army here. That currently puts Russia two ahead of the British. And so my two actions were just battling twice. Pretty straightforward. Uh, and now back to Wakan. So Wakan would first tax in a region she dominates. She has the tax action here. And it would actually be a free action too, a bonus. So she could also tax, I guess, with this. So let's uh, let's go ahead. She would actually, she would take the tax action first here because it's the highest loyalty uh, of, of or the highest, um, the highest number of stars. I can't think of the word right now. So she's, she would tax on this card first with her first action. So she's, she's going to tax in Kandahar, uh, which would be, she couldn't tax me because I don't have anything. I don't have anything in Kandahar. And uh, she actually also doesn't dominate Kandahar, so she would have to tax here first, which would be a free action. I have something in Herat, so she's going to tax my one coin from Herat with her one tribe. Uh, then if military cards are favored, they're not, so then she's going to radicalize. So let's go ahead and radicalize by purchasing from the bottom row, fourth column. Can't afford that. The first one she could afford would be this one in Herat. So that's what she'll buy, opium fields. I also realize I'm actually overnumbered here again. I keep, I keep falling into that trap. Um, so, sorry, I, I apologize for that. Let me back up here. So she would have to discard at the end of her turn because she has, uh, she have to get rid of two cards. I think it's gonna be, this would be the first one and this would be, the second one is going to be not, it would be this one. No, there would not be that one, it would be that. So, okay, non-political is the first, so not this one. Non-patriot is next, these are all patriots. So then non-leveraged, so not this one. Most player spies, more than Wakan spies. Fewest spies, so one of these two. Lowest rank, which is this one, Arthur Connolly. Art Connolly goes away. Sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm it's it, kind of the funny thing about bots is I forget sometimes that I have to manage them a little bit. 
Uh, so I'm kind of skipping, I'm, I'm skipping that, that discard from her court bit frequently. I realize that I'm, I'm hoping I'm catching it before anything serious gets skewed, but uh, maybe, maybe she had an extra card last turn. Uh, okay, anyway, anyway, so she taxed, that was done. Uh, now she's going to Radicalize, which I think we just determined is this card here. It goes on the right side. These two coins go there and there. Oh, I also have a tax haven. Of course I have a tax haven. I apologize for that. So she wouldn't have taken from me. She would have taken from uh, the Herat, or the Akandahar card, which would have been this one. Uh, and then that would have gotten played back. Yes, correct. I, I, I have a tax haven. Uh, all right, so uh, then she radicalized that card. It got played. It's going to add a pair of Afghan roads to Herat, preferentially connecting Herat to Transcaspia first and then Kabul next. Uh, all right, so that got played. And then the bonus action, she already took the tax action on this fellow, so she can't... Actually, it switches it to military now. Uh, so she could take the march action for free on Army of the Indus as a free action. So uh, she will do that. She's going to march, and she will march from Punjab, um, but she actually won't because she's loyal to Afghan and they don't have any armies there, so she won't march. These slide on down. And another dominance. So now there are two dominance cards in the market, uh, which is, I guess, almost, it's not good for me. It's not ideal for me because I wanted to score more points. Uh, and so unfortunately, uh, that second dominance card coming out, uh, then uh, th that, will, that will kick off uh, a, a dominance check. Sorry, I'm just looking at Hakan dominance stuff here. Making sure nothing is different for her. I don't think it is. Okay. Yeah. No. Her her dominance her dominance stuff is is normal. Just just like just like the rest. So um, all right. So because we've got two dominance checks in the market now, there will immediately be a dominance check. First, we need to see is anyone uh, dominating the regions? Are any of these three? They need four more than the other two. Uh, four more coalition blocks on the map than the other two. Not combined, you check them individually. So right now the answer is no. Russia does not have four more than the Brits. They only have two more than the British. So there is no, domi no one dominating the map right now. Despite there being 100 units out here, no one is really getting an edge. So then we check who has played the most cylinders. And the answer is, decisively, Wakan. So she will get three points, and I'll get a measly one for coming in second. Now, because the check was unsuccessful, normally on a successful check, you wipe the whole map and, uh, and go from there. But on an unsuccessful check, you, uh, you simply move on. So we are going to call it here. It is 9 o'clock on the nose, uh, which is where I said we would be ending. As it stands right now, I actually feel pretty good where I am at. I don't know if I would have won. These would have also been removed after that, after that check. They would be discarded, and then everything else would be replenished. Uh, I feel pretty good with where I'm at, honestly. I have a lot of dominance, or rather, a lot of loyalty to Russia. I have a lot of influence in Russia. They like me. Wakan was undoing some of what I was doing. I was trying to get Russia strong. She killed some Russian units. I was trying to, you know, get my spies over here to take her stuff, and I did that, but now she's got a bunch of spies as well. I don't know. I, um, I feel like if I could pick up some more Russian units, more armies, or kill, if I could start marching these dudes, you know, over this way to kill more British stuff, 
I think within a couple of turns I could have pulled it out. I could have probably won, maybe on the next dominance check. But I don't know. I don't know. I feel like it could have gone both ways. So uh, yeah, like I said, we're going to call it there. We did not finish, but we got a decent chunk through the game. Two dominance cards through, two out of the four. I uh, don't see when the others would have come up. Uh, they were a little, they are like middle of the deck. They were both close to each other, middle of the deck. Um, Wakan, I guess some more notes. Wakan will purchase a dominance card regardless of what her AI cards say. If she can afford it and if she will get the most points from it. She would never buy one and it would benefit me mostly. But she will go out of her way to buy a dominance card if it benefits her. Uh, otherwise, she mostly plays like how you'd expect a player to play. Like, you know, all... All of her cards, all of her little aids will tell you what she'll do. But honestly, in most cases, I think they are generally pretty logical with what a player would do. If they need money and there's a card that's going to give them a bunch of money, they'll buy it. If they, uh, if they have free actions, they're going to take them. And they're going to target what players have versus what no one is really vying for. So in this case, I had Russian loyalty, so she's going to kill my Russian units before she kills Afghan units, essentially. And I, um, yeah, actually, I, I, I think I'm going to set this up again pretty soon. Not tonight, but maybe tomorrow if I have free time. Maybe I'll set this up, uh, the, this, this up again and try. Because I think that was cool. Like I said, I think I, I gaffed a couple things. Thank you, Dan, for the, uh, thank you, Dan, for the catching a couple missteps, like my missing my tax haven or my, um, or uh, the, the bribes. When I'm, I'm trying to make sure that uh, Wakan's moves are functioning properly, and I forgot some of the basic rules of the game in that regard. But I, um, I think for the most part it went smoothly. I think it went well. Um, but anyway, that's going to be the stream tonight. Again, it's just me, uh, sort of off the cuff. I wasn't sure what I was going to do up until this morning. And so I kind of just figured, you know, yeah, I should, I should play a solo game of Pax Premier. I had mentioned it, I think, as a possibility a day or two ago. And I, I figured, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do it tonight. I read up on Wakan. Um, and I wanted to talk about those games, Kriegbot and Mushroom Eaters and all that. Uh, so if you enjoyed the stream or if you've enjoyed other stuff that, uh, that Phasing Player's done, check out the website, phasingplayer.com. I do occasionally post things that don't appear on YouTube there. Um, I've written a few reviews. I've written some kind of just think pieces on, on, on video games and board games. Uh, I've also got donation links there. If you do enjoy the stream and the content that Phasing Player puts out, go check out phasingplayer.com slash donate. Links to a few different things like Patreon and PayPal. Um, certainly no obligation to do so, but if you do, I certainly, certainly appreciate it. Uh, a bunch of you have actually donated some money, and that's been super nice. It's made me smile real big and, and filled my heart with joy uh, during this holiday season. And I, uh, I yeah, I, I look forward to putting out more videos and seeing all of you in the future. Now let me go ahead and very smoothly end this stream by tossing my hat and fading out at the same time, which is definitely not going to work, but we're still going to try it. So thank you, everybody. And uh, I don't have a good sign off right now. I was going to say God bless America, but I said that last time. Uh, so thank you, everybody. And keep watching the skies. Hoop. OK, sorry, I misclicked. <laughs>